Good afternoon, my name is Carlos Trigo. I am with Mr. Gary Ford. This is RFA, Rome Free Academy. Uh, today is February 13, 2004. We are interviewing Specialist Owsley. Um, she served in Desert Storm and is currently serving in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Um, could you state your full name, date, and place of birth for the camera? My, first, my name is Specialist Dawn Marie Owsley. I was born in Rome, New York. Um, what branch of the armed forces did you serve in? I was uh, on active duty during Desert Storm, and then I was went into the what they call the IRR, which is an inactive ready reserve. And then I went into the, the ready reserve, which is uh, the active reservist. Um, what is your current rank in the army? I'm a specialist, which is an E4, which is very little, but it's okay. How long was basic training? Basic training was eight weeks. Did you feel your training prepared you well for the desert, for desert storm and Afghanistan? No. I, I don't think even our training that we have during drill weekends prepares you for any, much of anything, to be honest with you. What, what would you need that you didn't get? We would, um, when, when, you, uh, when you do weapons qualification especially, you're laying in a prone position. They have a prone, prone supported and prone unsupported. The reality is, if someone's firing at you, you are most likely not going to be laying on the ground. You're going to be running. You're going to be up on a wall. You're going to be hiding behind a building. Um, so the, the training as far as the weapons qualification is not realistic to what you might actually face. And that I have experienced um, when we have had a, we get bombed regularly. When the alarms go off, we go to a fighting position, which is on a wall. They don't, we, there is no training for anything like that. You are standing at a wall. Also, uh, most of the bombings occur at night. There's very little uh, training as far as how to actually f fire your weapon at night. Um, during basic training, they give you something called tracer rounds, but we don't have tracer rounds. We fire regular. Uh, two weapons I have is a 9mm and an M16. We fire the same rounds at night that we fire during the day. There are no tracer rounds. Um, why did you join the Army instead of any other branch? Um, I have always wanted to be in the military ever since I was in high school. It was something that I always wanted to do. But I opted to get married and have children and felt it was important to us to raise my children. And as they got older and got school age, I became an age where I had to make a choice that I was getting too old and I decided to join the Army. Um, also, to be honest, in Rome, there's not a lot of job opportunities. And for me, I felt like I would get good training, get paid while I was being trained, and do something that was important to me. Um, what were your general duties in Desert Storm? During Desert Storm, I was a food inspector. And my main function in life was to make sure that the commissary which is, is a uh, grocery store for military personnel. I inspected the slaughtering, and not the slaughtering, but basically the cutting of the meat, uh, ensured that the, the temperatures were correct in the freezers, that there wasn't rodent infestation in the building or in the warehouses. I inspected something called TISA, which is a dry storage where we keep the boxes of of the food before they come to the store where they sit in a warehouse for a while. I would inspect those to make sure that there was not a lot of rodent infestation, mainly rats and uh, bugs. And yes, there was infestation. <laughs> um, and what were your duties in Afghanistan? 
In Afghanistan, I've, I've worked several different areas. My primary job when I went there was to work for what was called the J-1. Normally that is the S-1, which is basically your clerical person. It became J-1 because I worked for the joint staff as opposed to being home. The S-1 is the just the regular staff. I worked for the joint joint operations that are over there. When I say joint operations, there there's several different countries and several different branches of the military which are all involved in the campaign that that we're in. And Siege Assotive, which is what I'm under, is a combined joint special operations task force. So I became a J1. My primary duties were um, I processed awards. I in process soldiers that were coming in and out process soldiers that were going out. At one point uh, I was transferred over to work with PSYOPs which is Psycho Psychological Operations Co Command because my MOS is actually a civil affairs officer. MOS means? MOS is your job title. Um, like the principal is the principal of the, the school. Our MOS is is a three-digit number they give you which assigns you to a specific specialty. My specialty at this moment, what I am right now, is called a civil affairs specialist. I was very fortunate to uh, have an opportunity to leave the J-1, which was admin, and go out with the PSYOPs, which is their mission is to win the hearts and minds, and that's literally, you will hear that on TV, that's what their mission is, to win the hearts and minds of the people of Afghanistan. Civil Affairs comes in behind them or with them to say, now that we've gotten rid of the bad guys, how can we help you? What do you need? Typically it will be, we need a well, we need a school, we need our streets paved. There, there is no paved roads there, they're just dirt roads. Um, our function is to go in and try to give them a better, a, a better life, a better quality of life. How do you win their trust when historically outsiders have always been the bad guys? The only way you can win the trust of the Afghanistan people is if we do not abandon them. Um, we can go in there and we can say, yes, let's get rid of the bad guys. The bad guys are the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. We can get rid of them or we can scare them away. But if we do not stay as a presence, a strong presence, and let them know that we're not going to let anything happen to the Afghanistan people, the minute we leave, they will be right, we will be right back where we started. And that's what um, the Afghanistan people were first, uh, the Russians came in and took over and killed millions of people there and then the United States decided to help the Taliban. We, we helped them to get the Russians out of power and now we're getting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda out of power. Um, when were you sent into combat for the first time? <clears throat> and the first, well, I was deployed, my unit was deployed several months before me, I went as a, what they call an individual augmentee, meaning they needed a person for a job, and I had the skill, the MOS, so they pulled me from my unit and sent me with another group of people who I had no, no never met before, met them at Fort Bragg. And, and your what? original unit was the J-1? My original unit is the 414th Civil Affairs which is out of Utica, New York. Um, what was daily life like? Daily life in Bagram is, number one, it's very dirty. Um, the, the sand is not like what you would think of sand, like going to Florida to the beach. It is dust. It is like a talcum powder. And it covers everything. Um, during the summer months, you, you cannot keep anything clean. Um, and you, you don't realize how dirty you are until you 
leave the country and go somewhere else and wash your clothes and realize how embedded the, the dust gets into everything that you have. And it actually I noticed when I was in Germany I kept smelling an odor, wondering what it was and finally realized it was me. <laughs> oh, <dear>. <laughs> By opening my, my wall locker and I said, Oh, that's the smell I've been smelling for the past few days, it's me. It's it get there's a smell just from the, the the dust and the dirt that's there that just I guess it embeds in you. What did it do to your weaponry? It makes your weapons very, very difficult to keep clean. Um, we have to very regularly take everything apart and clean it because the dust gets into your firing pin. If, you're, if your firing pin doesn't work, you're in trouble. Um, well, here you said the weapons. So, how would you compare American weapons to that of the Iraqis or the Afghans? Unfortunately, a lot of the weaponry they have is weapons that they obtained from the United States through other factions that black market purchasing. Um, they, a lot of the um, Afghanistan people carried very, very old weapons, Russian weapons. Um, that they that are left over from the, when the Russians occupied their country. They have caches, what they call caches, that they've stockpiled in caves and different areas, mainly in caves where they, they stockpile all these Russian weapons, which uh, we, uh, one of our goals is to confiscate any of those caches that we find. We often read about these rocket-propelled grenades. It seems to be their number one choice against our vehicles, against our helicopters. Could you explain how they work? They're called IEDs, and thank God they do not have the technology to accurately use them, or you would be seeing many more deaths of American soldiers. Um, they pretty much set them on a mountain, they point them in the general direction of the, the base or where they think people are and they set them off. They, they don't know how to accurately um, adjust them the way, the way our soldiers know how to use them. So we're very fortunate that, that they have not uh, perfected that technology. They're getting better though. They're, they're getting much better at it. Um, in your transcript, it says you were assigned to the 304th PSYOP. Could you explain exactly what PSYOP is? They're psychological operations, and their function is, as I said earlier, to win the hearts and minds. The way they do that is by pamphlets. They, they drop pamphlets out in the city. We literally will drive in trucks and throw pamphlets out. Um, they do airdrops where they just load airplanes and they, they just fly over areas and just drop leaflets. Um, they actually will have matches with pictures of the bad guys offering rewards. We give those out. Um, pencils that uh, have a message, help the Americans. And Which seem to work best? The pamphlets so much of the population cannot read. Uh, the other thing that we also have are trucks with big speakers on them. And we will drive through the cities and we will say, um, we're here to rid the city of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And if you know where they are, if you will come to us, we will offer you a reward. We will protect you. And we will, we will take the bad guys away. And people do come forward. Um, there are large rewards offered for information like that. Um, what were your officers like? The officers that I worked with in the psychological operations were a great group of people. They've become, uh, they've become a little numb. I think a lot of people over there have become a little bit numb and 
uh, you get to a point where I think jaded is a good word. You, you begin to forget that not everyone there is, is trying to kill you. At some points, it, it it's it's hard, it, especially people who spend way way too much time there. They be they become very jaded, and and everyone is Taliban. Everyone is Al Qaeda. Everyone is is uh, a potential threat, and and they are. You can't tell the difference. You can't walk down the street and say, that's Taliban and that's that's a regular Afghanistan citizen. They blend in very well with the population. Um, Did you ever see any captured Taliban or Al-Qaeda? I, I saw um, three Taliban that were captured. I did not see them captured, but I saw them after they were captured. And um, basically, it's like you see on television where they put the bag over their head so that um, they can't see where where they're at. We we don't want them to know where they're at. We don't want them to know how to get to where they're at. They, on at Bagram, we have a special prison for people like that. And um, I, I also should mention that I'm on a special forces compound. Special forces are the ones that go out and kick the doors down and raid people's homes if, if they hear word that there may be a Taliban or Al-Qaeda hiding in a certain area. We, we Special forces are the guys that go out and hunt them down. Um, did you receive any decorations, medals, or commendations? I saw many, many because that's what I processed. I processed over 500 awards for soldiers who were there, ranging from Army Commendation Medals to Purple Hearts. Um, and the Purple Hearts are not ones that you want to see because that means somebody was either killed or more very, very severely injured. Um, did you actually receive one? Or? I have, re I have a, a, what they call a Joint Service Achievement Medal, which we go to the joint word again because I'm with the joint combined special forces task force over there. Um, that translated to not wartime would be an army commendation medal or um, army achievement medal. Do you know exactly what you received it for? Um, I, I received it when, when I was uh, transferred over to PSYOPs. They had no, uh, they had no S1. They had no J1. The first sergeant was doing all their paperwork, <laughs> so they they asked if I would be willing to go, and basically, um, I said I would go there. And I, the reason he awarded it to me was because I created their office. Basically, I took all the papers that they had sitting everywhere, and the files, and organized them. Um, and did medals, helped with promotion packets because some of the soldiers there are eligible to be promoted and worked on their promotions and awards. Um, if they got hurt, on, on, if you get hurt over there, it's called a line of duty. Like they might fall off something and break their ankle or something. I did a lot of those type of paperwork things. Um, what would you say was the most interesting experience that you? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, what would you say was the most interesting or inspiring thing that you experienced so far? The most inspiring thing and the most interesting thing to me was when I was allowed to go to a city called Garnez with us. I went with the spy chasers and I went with psyops and the civil affairs, and I was actually able to meet with. Um, some village elders. We went out to a very, very remote area and they invited us all to have a meal with them. They're very gracious people. They, they always want to give you tea, they want to feed you. And while uh, we had one of these particular meetings, I asked if I could speak with the women, which the women are not. Uh, you don't see the women, they're pretty hidden. And I was allowed to go into a room with over 20 women and sit down and speak with them. And that was, 
that was the most uh, awesome thing that made my whole time away from my family worthwhile to, to have that opportunity to sit and ask these women how they felt about us being there. The women were terrified to answer that question. They said, we love you, we love the Americans, we love to serve you, we would love to cook for you. Um, so I realized I wasn't going to get too far with, with the, asking them questions. So basically I told them very basic things about myself, that I was a mom, that I had children. They wanted to know about my daughters. And, I, and when I said I had a daughter who was in school, and if she wants to go to college, she, she will go to college. Or if she wants to get married and have a family, she can do that. But she has a choice. And they were amazed that, that women in this country have, a, have that opportunity. They also wanted to know why I was not covered. Why I didn't, they, they're all veiled. Most of them wear something called a burqa, which completely covers them. You cannot see their eyes or anything. And they wanted to know why I did not have one. And I said, because in the United States, we're, we don't have to cover ourselves. We're allowed to dress how we want to dress. And we're free to do that, which is why we want to come in here, because we want you to be free, if that's what you choose. Some of the women um, have gone from the burkas to the veils. They still veil themselves, but it's not the way it was when Taliban was there. Everyone was in the burqa. You did not go out on the street unless you were completely covered from head to toe. Um, what person or persons do you remember best from your service? I think as far as the people go, the Afghanistan people, it would be the people who come and work on our compound. Um, they are very gracious. They're, they're very happy just to, to shake your hand, just to, to have a picture taken with you. Um, they are very, very poor. So to give them a sweater or a jacket means everything in the world to them. They're very appreciative because they have so little. Um, one of the things that, that's, it, it's not funny, but it's, it, it would be funny to us. Think of your oldest tennis shoes that you have, that you would just throw away. They will fight for those shoes because some of them have no shoes or they have no soles. Uh, their shoes are completely worn. Uh, it get, and it gets very cold there. So for them to have something beside the little plastic sandal that they can afford to having a tennis shoe or a boot that actually uh, covers their feet, that's, that's a huge thing for them. As far as uh, the soldiers go, I don't think I will ever forget uh, the fear that I felt every time I watched a convoy get together to go out to look for the bad guys and seeing, seeing some of them come back wounded and, and knowing that a few days earlier I had signed them out in a book and now uh, some of them didn't, did not come back alive and that, that uh, probably I don't think that I'll ever be the same or, or forget about that. Um, what experience would you say left the greatest impression on you? Seeing the, the need of the people there, seeing how poor they are and how little they really have compared to our standard of life and compared to even what we consider poor countries. I've, I've been to Guatemala, and I, I thought they were very poor people. Their poor is nothing like what I've seen the Afghanistan people endure. They, I, I cannot stress enough how incredibly poor the majority of them are. That is a little standout memory for me. Um, did you perform any unusual service or duties? Um, I, I, going out with the PSYOPs and the CA was un, very unusual for someone of, for my MOS, being over there as an admin person, even though I'm with a civil affairs unit, I was very fortunate 
that my first sergeant saw something within me and he knew that I wanted to uh, be more proactive and he gave me the opportunity to do that. So that was, uh, a lot of people were jealous. They wanted to know how I got so lucky. All my family will tell you, what do you mean lucky to go out to a fire base where you're risking your life, where you're being shot at? Um, but it, it made it mean something to me. You mentioned earlier you followed some spy catchers. I didn't follow them. I ran. I was with them. I was able. What, what makes a spy catcher a spy catcher? A spy chaser. Or a spy chaser. I'm um, sorry. Basically, their intelligence. That's the intelligence of the military. And what they do is, they get reports from people of, uh, hey, in this area. There's a group of people who are doing this. For instance, they were collecting tolls on roads that they, they were not supposed to be doing. Um, they were robbing people. Our spy chasers go to the authorities and they say, we know this is going on and we believe that you know who they are and we would like to give you a chance to, uh, to tell us who they are and where we can find them so that we can keep your city safe. And it's pretty effective. In Desert Storm, did you work for, with people of other countries? During Desert Storm, I worked st strictly at Fort Drum. I was never left the country. Um, what about in Afghanistan? Have you worked with some other people of other countries? I have. Uh, I had a very unique opportunity to meet the United Arab Emirates Colonel, who for some reason took a great liking to me, and would invite me over to their compound for uh, meals, change of ceremony, their national holiday. Um, I've met the Lithuanians, been able to uh, go over to their compound. We're not technically allowed to go over to other branches of the military's compounds, but I was able to get permission from my command to go and uh, meet, meet some of these people. The Lithuanians uh, regularly come on to our compound, so we, we are able to interact with them. Um, do you feel that the current foreign policy is working, or would you have it changed? I would have it changed. Um, I think they need to step up there is a huge focus on Iraq right now, but we have not completed our job in Afghanistan, and we need to step up the military action, which is in the works. Uh, I believe it's been on the news that we are currently um, going to be operating several more fire bases throughout the country, that we are much more actively going to pursue the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And I think it's very important for us to, to call this a successful campaign, we must not give up. We have, things have become too calm there, and we need to show a greater presence, in my opinion. Um, could you please explain some of the pictures that you have there? Well, I brought a picture of the current president, who is Hamid Karzai, who is, uh, I think it was approximately a month ago, they actually met in the city of uh, Kabul. They had a big meeting to reestablish a government, or to establish a government. Um, the, one of the biggest problems that we have in Afghanistan right now is the Pakistan border. Uh, that is, the Pakistans are not our friends, in my opinion. They have. Uh, undermined many things that the United States has tried to do. They've hidden, they've let Al-Qaeda and Taliban fairly easily walk across the border. Um, there's uh, several sentiments out there that, that feels Pakistan is actually harboring Osama bin Laden somewhere. Um, I will tell you that I saw caves. As you drive through Afghanistan, there's caves everywhere. and. Um, it would probably take them a million years to go through every one of those caves 
which is where they hide caches, the Taliban hides, uh, the caches being the, the large group of weapons. And that's where um, we uh, have lost some of our soldiers who found those caches and tried to uh, detonate them and had no idea that the tunnels ran in several different directions and other tunnels were full of cache and uh, it, you'll see that on the news every now and then where it, things will go awry. They think they're blowing up one cache and the next thing you know there's explosions everywhere. I think, um. I, think I can say that it was on the news that um, a city was pretty much leveled because of uh, something like that happening. Um, what about your actual photographs? These photographs, when uh, initially when I got to Bagram, this is what we lived in. It was tense. There was no air conditioning. There was no heating. Don't be fooled by what you see there. There was no air conditioning or heating. And it was very, very hot during the daytime till you, you could not go in your tent. You, you had to be outside in a shaded area. Um, this is also, this is what it looked like before um, the contractors came in. Then the contractors came in and they built this, which was called, they're called bee huts, which is nothing more than plywood buildings. But they have heat and they have air conditioning. So we were very happy for them. Um, I haven't seen a, a lot of bugs or things like that, of that nature. I, we did have a camel spider, which I, I brought a picture of a camel spider, um, which I would say try to get a clear picture off the internet. They are very frightening looking. They look sort of like a cross between a scorpion and a spider. Mm -hmm. And they move incredibly fast. And my roommate and I had the opportunity to um, chase one down and kill it one day, which was trying to live in our house. So we, uh, we got rid of that one as quickly as we could. But they're fast. It took both of us running around with objects chasing it from out from underneath our makeshift little shelves we have. So you mentioned earlier a bodyguard. Would you mind sharing that picture and story? In Afghanistan, when we go to a city, for instance, this is the city of Kabul, which you, you'll see on the news a lot, Kabul. In order for us to be able to walk the streets without being mobbed, the young teenage boys will come up and offer to be your bodyguard for a very small fee. And what they do is they virtually keep the, the local Afghanistan people away from you because we draw so much attention when we're there, they will follow us. It, it will be like the Pied Piper. You'll walk down the street and you'll look and there'll be 20 people and you'll look again and there's 100 people. And um, of course that poses a problem for our safety because you don't know who's in the crowd. It could be anybody. So typically what will happen is um, we will always have special forces with us. They will always be constantly looking around for anyone that looks suspicious or anyone with a weapon. Um, and the police, the local police are very supportive of us when we come in. They will keep keep the crowds back as much as, as they can. Um, this is a picture of a small crowd which, which joined us uh, while we were waiting for french fries. Um, it's, they're just so amazed to see Americans and then to see an American woman in carrying weapons, carrying weapons, walking around with no covers on our heads is quite a, a thing to them. And they are just amazed to see us and look at us. So they follow us everywhere. You had a story about someone that you lost. We had a young, a young fellow from our unit, and I'll try not to cry when I talk about him, because it was very heart-wrenching. His name is Specialist Adam Kinzer, and uh, he'd been in Afghanistan since July. He uh, 
He had two more weeks and he was about to go home to his wife. Where's the camel spare? To his wife who was expecting a baby in March. And um, he was one of the soldiers that um, unfortunately there was a cache that was found. I'm not sure if they've determined whether it was uh, booby trapped, which is one of the things they'll, they'll do to, to try to to kill us. But um, he was uh, he was just recently killed, and like I said, he was he was due to go home in. Uh, it said here two weeks. I thought it was three weeks, but he had about two more weeks to go before he would be home. Mm -hmm. Would you like to mention anything else? No, I just... Um, the most important thing is that we don't forget about Afghanistan, that we don't forget that, that you cannot go in and just scare the bad guys away, that we, if we're to be effective of what what we're trying to do there, there needs to be a lot more with the civil affairs people, which is the people I work with. We need to make a better way of life for them, or what we've done is for not. It, if if we pull out, a, another force will come in and take over, and that's what these people are used to. This has happened to them for thousands and thousands of years. There has been somebody coming in and occupying their country. And we have an opportunity to make a difference. And as an American, I hope that we don't let these people down. That's how I feel.